blank is my favorite sleeper wide receiver. We'll go Heath, Dave, Jamie. Heath, who's your favorite sleeper? I will call Tyrell. Tyrell Williams, who has been my favorite sleeper before a lot of this Antonio Brown drama. But I think that we need to think about the idea of what if Antonio Brown's not there for a couple of weeks or something happens midseason or he's not playing through an injury. Tyrell Williams could be a top 20 wide receiver without Brown, even if Brown is there all year. I think with the number of targets they have to replace last year from last year, 361, I believe. There is enough room for Brown to be a number one wide receiver or a close approximation of one. And Tyrell Williams to still get close to 100 targets. And with his career efficiency, about nine yards per target, I would expect a top 30, top 33 season, even if Brown plays 16 games, which seems kind of unlikely right now. Okay. I'll Tyrell say... Williams going 137th overall. Sorry, Dave. Go ahead. That's okay. I, I'm starting to warm up to Tyrell, too, just because of the whole Antonio Brown head foot saga. Um, I'm running out of sleepers. Paris Campbell was a sleeper for me. He's not practicing. Kiki QT was a sleeper for me. He got hurt. So I'm just going to go back to the guy I'm turning back the clock with, and that's Deshaun Jackson, who's going to be deep threat man for the Eagles. Sounds like he and Carson Wentz have finally gotten on the same page after a slow start to camp. He was actually a good deep ball target for the Bucks when he had a catchable pass. Uh, Pro Football Focus says that he had 10 catchable deep balls. He caught nine of them. Four of them went for touchdowns. I, I think he could turn back to the type of year, not like his last year in Philadelphia, but his first year in Washington. Had about 100 targets, 56 catches, 1,169 yards. Even that might be a little too high, but six touchdowns. I think he can get you that. So round nine, round 10, good bench receiver to have. Sean Jackson. All right, Jamie, who you got? I'll go with Marquez Valdez-Scantling. You know, after what uh, Pete Prisco drink told me, I think it's uh, it, there's a chance for him to have a big season as the second guy there in Green Bay. And I know we used to fight over Geronimo Allison, Adam, but uh, not that Allison, I think, is going to have a, a, a terrible year. But it sounds as if that they are really in love with what Valdez-Scantling can do. And I think it's going to be a fun season for him in his sophomore campaign. Yeah, I, I think uh, that's one. I certainly reports have to be adjust. You know, rep reports have to make you adjust your thinking because I was definitely Team Allison, and now I don't know. I, I mean, I feel like they should probably be going pretty close in drafts, but yep. I guess I'd take MVS ahead of them. You're you're there, right? You take MVS yeah, ahead of Allison. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I saw right, so Allison Tyra in Williams. PPR, but it's by I think literally one spot. All right, Tyrell, Deshaun Jackson, and MVS. Now, follow up question, Heath. You're drafting today. You're not getting Tyrell Williams, you know, 135th or whatever I said. When would you pull the trigger on Tyrell Williams? Well, I think what Jamie likes to say is I always take him four rounds before I have to anyway. <laughs> so that probably won't be a problem for me. Um, I'm fine with him in the ninth round. That's easy. Okay. All right, we'll go Heath, fifth, Dave, Jamie again. Uh, who's your favorite breakout receiver? I'll, good. I get to go first. I'll take D.D. Westbrook. We've been talking about him all summer. Uh, I think there's a huge target opportunity. Does not sound like Marquise Lee is going to be ready for the start of the year. There's just no competition for Westbrook in that slot role. They don't really have a tight end, which is kind of what this offense usually focuses on. I think Westbrook gets some of those targets. Leads all wide receivers. I've bumped him up just a little bit. I've got him 127 targets now which makes him wide receiver 25 at pretty close to last year's efficiency. And I do think there's a chance this offense is more creative. He has better quarterback play, and he is just a more efficient wide receiver. Would not be surprised at all if D.D. Westbrook is a top 20 wide receiver this year. Can I, can I ask you a question? Because I'm in total agreement with everything you're saying, but there's a report from The Athletic that uh, Nick Foles is really favoring Chris Conley a ton and a lot of positive things on D.J. Chark. Can Westbrook get distance himself enough from those guys who I think we all view as just guys because Conley really has never done anything and Chark is you know still young and I, I think still profiles as you know a deep ball threat but can can Westbrook separate himself because I think we've all kind of like tied Westbrook to Marquise Lee and if Lee is not there like the the sky's the limit for Westbrook are we getting too overexcited about him do you think and and I'm, I'm not asking you Heath to defend it. I'm just asking you because you're the Westbrook guy not to say that you know you're, you're wrong in that regard I have al almost every week during the training camp preseason that I've updated my projections. I have moved Conley and Shark up just a little bit. I have them second and third now on the team in targets. I do buy into it just a little bit, but I also think there are enough targets to go around if Lee's not even there, and they don't have any sort of threat at tight end. They're going to have to be a pretty consolidated passing attack. 
All right. D.D. Westbrook. Uh, Dave, who's your favorite breakout this year? I think Amari Cooper is in line for a career year. You saw what he did in 11 games after he joined the Cowboys at midseason last year. Had almost 900 yards, had seven touchdowns. It was up and down. The targets were not. He had at least seven targets in nine of those 11 games. And if you, if you take his per-game average in those 11 games and you stretch it out over 16, it's 1,300 yards and 10 touchdowns. And those would be career-type numbers for Amari Cooper. And it's an added bonus. If Ezekiel Elliott does hold out, that means a little bit more passing from the Cowboys. Maybe means eight targets plus per game for Amari Cooper. And I, I, I actually I like the additions that they made with Randall Cobb and bringing back Jason Witten, not for those guys for fantasy, but just to keep defenses honest. And Amari Cooper won't see nearly as many double teams. I, I think as long as he stays healthy, it's a little bit of an issue right now because of his heel, but as long as he stays healthy, he's going to be worth that third-round pick. I, I like him a lot. I, man, I, I think he's tough because he had some really bad games and some huge games, very inconsistent. Uh, but what, what gives me a little bit of hope, more hope, is how well he did in the postseason, Amari Cooper. Two postseason games, Cooper was really good in both of them. Um, and also, he only had 24% of the targets during that stretch with the Cowboys, the regular season stretch, which was nine games. Uh, so that's, you know, that's really not that much for a number one wide receiver. That could go up. I'd probably stay about the same, but, you know, it's not like he was a total target hog. But Dak Prescott was throwing more than ever. Dak Prescott was throwing five more times per game than we've ever seen him throw. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm a little bit nervous about Amari Cooper. But I'm a little bit nervous about all those wide receivers. It's kind of like the running backs in round three. I mean, that's why they're in round three. They have question marks. Thielen, it's gonna, Diggs. Yeah. It's going to be interesting with the Cowboys, you know, with the, the, the target share with Cobb being an upgrade of what they had last year. I think over Beasley, you know, maybe it's a wash, but yeah, but, but still, I, I think, you know, if, if Cobb is healthy, I think he's an upgrade. And then, you know, Witten just being the security blanket for, you know, Dak, does that continue with the year absence? You know, just having that player there that he can rely on that, you know, is not going to be exactly flashy and not good for fantasy, but good for, you know, his team. So it, that, that I think is going to be plus Michael Gallup getting better. You know, I think that's something that gets overlooked. He, he, uh, he started running some different routes, even in the game against San Francisco, you know, that, that I think you have to take notice of, that he's not just really a deep ball guy anymore. Okay, so Dave says Amari Cooper. Heath has D.D. Westbrook as a breakout. Obviously, you can have breakouts in different tiers with different expectations. Jamie, who's your favorite breakout? I mean, do I have to say it? Uh, it's yeah. Curtis, I... Curtis Samuel. Um, oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm obviously very excited about the opportunity for him. Uh, the hype. I think has gotten a little too out of control with the reports out of Carolina, but we'll see if he lives up to it. You know, he's having a great preseason. You know, if you're just talking about a uh, uh, training camp, excuse me, if you're just talking about camp reports for a player, um, it, it's hard to find somebody who's had more glowing comments and, and reports and reviews about themselves, <laughs> um, you know, than Curtis Samuel has had. So I, I I'll, I'll go back to what I've said all along. I, I still think there's a higher ceiling for DJ Moore just because I think he has, a little bit more of a better pedigree and upside, not by much, but uh, I, I think if Curtis Samuel is right there with him in terms of what the targets can be and, and the upside, uh, we saw it at the end of last season, you know, six of his final seven games, 11 or more PPR points, two of those were without cam. So take that into account, good or bad. But uh, I just think you're talking about somebody that's going to be very involved in an offense that doesn't have a ton of playmakers at the receiver position. Um, you know, especially if Greg Olson can't stay healthy. So, I just like the the opportunity for for Curtis Samuel this year. It's just where's the ADP going to settle for him once we get to real drafts? You know that could sort of uh, you know hurt his his value because I, I still think there's a little bit of a ceiling on him. I think both well, the guys in Carolina are potential playmakers, though. I mean I, that's just basically what their skill set is: is they they can make a catch in the short area and then break it for a long run. The one thing that I will say Samuel might have an edge on more in is the deep ball because I think Samuel's faster than, than DJ Moore. So it's exciting. The, both of these guys are exciting. There were seven games, the, their last seven games last year, their numbers were almost equal. And in five of the seven games, both of them had at least 10 PPR fantasy points. Kind of makes it interesting if you wanted to take both of them to be uh, maybe your third and fourth receivers. If you're starting three receivers in a flex, you can get both of these guys. I think most weeks you'll be happy with what you get from both of them. 
All right, Curtis Samuel is currently going 91st overall. That's eighth round, Jamie. How do you feel about that? That's over the last month and half PPR. Oh, I mean, if I could still get him there, I'd be thrilled about it. But uh, we did a draft um, this past week. It was a was it the 14 team one where Will took him in the fifth round? I think it was. Um, yeah, it was a Panthers fan. He took him in the fifth round, and I, I, I don't think I've cursed in anybody in the draft room before. Or in a long time. Oh, yeah, you have. In a long time. Oh, yeah, come yeah, on. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm sorry, I meant to say in a long time. And I was I was pissed <laughs> at Will yeah. uh, for taking him that soon. Yeah. Well, I mean, the truth of the matter is Will Brinson, who hosts the Pick 6 podcast, which should be, you should be listening to, he probably makes Jamie curse during a mock draft. Uh, basically at the start of every mock draft. <laughs> no, he's, he's been great. Played. He's been great. Yeah. And it's been two years now he's been great. No way. Come on. 100%. Uh, there, 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 are some, there are some worse culprits. Uh, one of them does another podcast with you. Scott? No. The other guy. Chris? Yeah, Chris is, is on late? my Chris is on my list. Well, I mean, Will earned it like Will stands for walking in likely late. That's yes, like, Will that's Will, reputation. Will is the godfather of being late to drafts. Uh, but he has not been bad for two years. Okay. Uh, all right, guys, let's do a bus uh, bus segment here as we uh DD Westbrook, Amari Cooper, and Curtis Samuel as breakouts, Tyrell Williams as Sean Jackson, and Marquez Valdez Scantling as sleepers. We'll go Jamie Dave Heath here. Jamie, who's uh, your bust candidate this year among the bust candidates? Who would you like to highlight? I, I, I love Adam Thielen as a player, and I think he's going to put up good stats, but he's going in the second round, and that's just way too soon. I mean, even if he if he replicates exactly what he did a year ago, then it's worth it. But you're asking him to be as superhuman as possibly he, he, he might be able to. And he had a great catch in the preseason game against the Saints. You know, a lot of people get excited about that, and they should. He's going to put up a lot of good numbers. But I think the touchdowns come down to, you know, six or seven. I think the yards come down closer to 1,100. Uh, catches, I think, go under 100. Uh, it's an offense that wants to run the ball. I think they will be successful doing so. Um, Diggs is still there. They have another tight end in the mix that they're going to use both those guys. And, you know, I, I think you'll find that Cousins may spread the ball around a little bit more. And, you know, again, you look at the sample size, it's small. Um, but in those final three games, you know, when Stefanski took over, Thielen was battling some injuries. He just wasn't as involved. And so is that going to be the norm? I don't think so. I don't think he's going to be. I think it, it, if you look at it, it was he, he was definitely third in targets. He might have been fourth uh, behind Diggs, Cook, and and Rudolph. Um, but there's just a, a, a additional mouths to feed, especially if you know Dalvin Cook can stay healthy. And I just don't think that he's a second-round pick. And I don't know if you can justify him even going – you know, early third and non PPR in, in, in PPR it's fine, but in non PPR, I think going early third is too soon. Do you think he'll get a hundred yards per game for eight straight games again? No, <laughs> I mean, that was Jerry Rice numbers. <laughs> no, yeah. I agree. And they also really like their, they got a new slot receiver, Chad Beebe, who's related. You remember Don Beebe, Adam with the bills? Of course. This is Come his on. kid. Of course. This is his kid. And really, he, he can, wow. own, he, <sighs> Like, he'll say he could line up anywhere, but he's being groomed for the slot, which means Thielen is now out of the slot. And so he's going to play outside. And if he's competing for targets outside with Stephon Diggs, it's going to be a headache for the defenses that Minnesota plays. But I think his targets could come way down. So I, I think we all agree that Thielen at his ADP is just a massive bust. Well, massive. I mean, he's a third-round pick, though, not a second-round pick. He's not a fourth-round pick. I'm, fine, I just don't think I'm going to draft him very often. Okay, fair enough. Uh, who's your bus, Dave? Uh, AJ Green's ADP is starting to fall to a point where he's not as busty, but late round five is still pretty bad for a guy who isn't going to be ready for week one. We don't know if he's going to be ready weeks two or three. He'll probably have a week where he comes back and he's got to shake the rust off. It's a new offense that he's not going to have the benefit of, of training camp in the preseason to fully diverse himself in. And he, two of the last three seasons, he's ended the year hurt. So I don't know how many games you're going to get out of A.J. Green. Um, but I did do an undercover mock where I got him in round seven. And I love that. I'll Ooh. take that all day. I don't know how often I'll find him in round seven. Maybe by the time the season uh, is a week away or so and there still aren't any good reports about A.J. Green, at that point maybe, I'll, maybe we'll all see him going in round seven. And I would be comfortable getting him then. But round five is just too soon. Okay. Uh, he, I, will, your bus. I will say I, I'm, I'm – perfectly fine taking aj green in the fifth round but i think we have to talk about the most obvious bust after the last week it is the wide receiver preview and we don't know exactly where antonio brown's going to be 
weeks from now or months from now. But I came into the season thinking Antonio Brown could be a bust just because of the downgrade in offense, the downgrade in quarterback, and the question marks surrounding that whole thing there in Oakland. Their offensive line looks like a disaster right now. He does not, I believe, can't play football right now because of his feet. He's getting some sort of argument with the league over his helmet. And this does not sound like a very good situation. I, I would not take Brown in the third round for sure. I have a hard time taking him in the fourth. I think you have to look more like the fifth round for Antonio Brown. And the really interesting question is, like, if you come to a choice between Antonio Brown and A.J. Green, if we hear a report in the next week that A.J. Green's recovery is going well and they think he's going to be fine for week two or week three, I might take Green ahead of Brown. Yeah, I agree. Um, it, uh, it, it It's hard to trust him. I mean, I did a poll. Um, if you were drafting him this weekend, this was uh, you know, a few days ago, uh, would you take him round two or three, round four or five, round five or later, round never, no way? Um, four or five right now was the leader at 33%, but 28% never, no way was second, and round two or three was third. Now, I, I think round five or later was, was 19%. Um, I, I think if you're drafting right now, it, it's he's in that same category of Melvin Gordon and – um, I don't want to say Ezekiel Elliott yet, but uh, maybe you can put AJ Green in there if you want to. But if if it gets to just a point where it, you take a chance on somebody, then the hope is that he's playing. There's a lot of speculation that you know he's doing this to avoid training camp and to avoid maybe being on hard knocks in terms of being a, a, a little bit more of a featured option. They clearly have to talk about this. Um, it's just it's just hard to say what's what's happening with him right now. Is he really going to walk away from all this money with because of a helmet? No. Well, let me let me be the optimist here, because I don't really think the Raiders' offensive line is looking like a long-term disaster. I think they came into the to training camp looking like they were going to have one of the better offensive lines in football. But you know, you've got Incognito suspended for a couple of games. You've got Gabe Jackson dealing with an injury. I understand there are some issues now. I do think there's a chance that there's that's a really good offensive line for a good chunk of the season. Now, let's say Antonio Brown is gets a, gets a new helmet. His feet are fine. He's ready for week one, and everything looks good. When when would you take uh, Antonio Brown in that scenario? Round three. Early round three. Wait, so we're we're pretending like for the next month everything's just going to be normal and there's not going to be any weirdness anymore? Yes. That seems like a really strange thing to pretend based on what's <laughs> happened the last week, but I would agree with round three. <laughs> oh, oh, look at those feet. Wow, if you're yeah. watching our video, there are the feet. Uh, would you take Adam Thielen or Antonio Brown, assuming everything's fine? Thielen, Thiel easy. Thielen. Brown. Brandon Cooks or Antonio Brown? Cooks. 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 Okay. You you are talking about the best receiver in fantasy five years running, basically. Yeah, right? but he's, yeah. you know he's not going to put up numbers with Carr like he put up with Roethlisberger. We knew, we knew that yeah. from the day we knew that from the day he was traded. Yes, yes, I know. I just I wonder at what, what point we go a little too far in downgrading him because I because I think that the question I just asked you, right? If everything's fine and you know he's he tomorrow he's back, you know, and you said round three. Well, I feel like if I asked you when do you take Antonio Brown, if I had asked you this a month ago, before the offensive line injuries, before the foot, b or before the feet, before the helmet. I think you probably would have been a little bit earlier with Antonio Brown, like late round two, early round three, whereas now I'm kind of feeling like you're valuing him as like a mid-round three to late round three guy. I feel, I just feel like we've mentally downgraded him uh, to the point where that even if he does come back, we're going to be a little bit sour on him. He does come back and he's perfectly fine. You know what I'm saying? No, I, I think you're right in that regard. I mean, I'll, I'll speak for myself. I had him right around 20th in PPR, I think like 22 or 23 in non-PPR. But you have to take into account that there's something off with him. I mean, it's just, it's, it's yeah. hard not to. So, you know, you have to sort of take that into account when you're valuing him and evaluating him. Like, what if he hates the field at the Coliseum? I, I mean, I, I, <laughs> you, you, you wonder if, forget about the field, what if he just hates David, uh, Derek Carr and John Gruden after spending some time with them? Like, this just uh, isn't for me. What if he just becomes a malcontent to cash in this new extension that he got? Collect the thirty million guaranteed. Okay, he's never, fair. he's fair. never, he's never been part of a consistently a losing team, and so if that frustration starts to wear on him, which could be part of the problem last year when they were losing, 
and the quarterback was blaming him for things that never happened before. You know, they're, they're, it's just it's so hard to say that he's not, forget about the numbers because the numbers may be fine for a stretch of games, but he just may say, "I'm I'm done with this. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of Gruden. I'm tired of Carr underthrowing me. I'm tired of all of this." And he can say those things and not retire and still collect the guaranteed money. And and Dave, you bring up a point. The, the you guys will know this more than me. When, when does the field switch in Oakland? Honestly, oh, 2020 October when they go to no. Life. I mean from baseball to football. Oh yeah, I, uh, October. Right. So you know, I mean that that may be a problem for his feet. Yeah, but they're they're like they're away <laughs> from the Coliseum for like two straight months. And that's another so, thing. The travel is terrible. Yeah. The Raiders and the Bucks specifically have really bad schedules this year. Okay. By the way, um, Derek Carr purchased a house in Las Vegas right next to John Gruden's house in Las Vegas. So I bet they'd be wonderful to hang out with their next door neighbors. It's going to be weird when he's not a Raider next year. It is going to be weird. All right. Let's uh, let's take one last break here on fantasy football today, and we'll come back and wrap up part one of our wide receivers preview. <laughs> 